All right. Hey, it's great to be with you. All of you watching online, we're so glad that you're here. Some of you know, we just got back from Israel uh, and I have many stories to tell. They're going to come out, I'm sure, along the way. Um, But especially in this Advent season, as we uh, dive into Christmas, I'll be here in the sanctuary uh, next Sunday and throughout all of December, every Sunday, right here to bring the word of God. And I hope that you'll be here and make plans to be here every week. Don't miss one week as we uh, dive into this uh, season together. Bringing the last message today in our series in the book of Proverbs. But first, turn to Matthew 6. Turn to Matthew 6. We're going to let Jesus give us uh, the downbeat for everything that we're going to talk about today. And as you turn there, um, one of the greatest uh, economists of the first half of the 20th century was a man named Irving Fisher. In fact, he was kind of uh, the first celebrity economist, and um, he talked a lot about supply and demand and interest rates and inflation. We probably could use some of his guidance today, in fact, or not. September 1929, Fisher proclaimed that stock prices have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. And then he predicted, he said, I expect to see the stock market a good deal higher within a few months. Yeah, you laugh because you know history. Nine days later, the devastating stock market crash devastated, I mean, millions of people. Um, In the words of the great philosopher Yogi Berra, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. And especially when it comes to money. Because we put our security in our money and then we realize it doesn't provide the security we're looking for. And maybe you saw that today's title of the message, money. That's it. Today's message. We're going to talk about money and you might be thinking, I came on the wrong day. Here's the thing. Um, I know preacher friends of mine who don't like talking about money. I love talking about money. I love preaching about money. Not because, you know, I want something from you. This is not my church. This is his church. We give to the Lord. He's head of our church. But it's what I want for you. And what I want for you is what I've experienced in my life. Stacy and I both, our, our, our family, we've experienced a real freedom that comes when money has its rightful place. And today we're going to learn that. And Jesus gives us the definitive word about it. And then from there, we're going to dive into Proverbs. Matthew 6 Verse 19, it says this, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now notice, he doesn't say don't lay up treasures. He says lay up treasures, but make sure they're laid up in the right place. Invest in eternal things. And he says don't Lay them up here because, can I say it? It's stupid. That's why. The the writers of Proverbs say, it's foolish. Fools do that. We we, we cover every possible contingency regarding our money and our our resources and our savings and whatever and paying the bills. And yet, we often focus so much there that we lose track and focus of what really matters the most. And then he says in verse 21, The most definitive word, I could argue, about worship that the Lord offers us, and he offered many. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We'll unpack that along the way today. Look at verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, and or your whole body will be filled with light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. Okay, so there's only one first. You can't have two. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, or mammon is the term that's used that means money and all that it entails. Now, commentators agree he's teaching here about money, and then suddenly he has this seemingly, this diversion off to talk about the body and the eye and darkness, and what is that about? And what he's saying here is this. You and I can see right now because of light that's coming into our eyes. Uh, you, without light, you can't see a thing. He's saying that it's possible, if your eyes are bad, you can be in the light, 
and yet you're in darkness. You can be flooded with light, but everything is black. He's saying this, an inordinate desire for money and wealth and material things blinds us. And he's saying more than, I think he's implying, more than anything that captures our hearts regarding worship and what we treasure will be our money and our material things. Now, most of us know that coming into this message and, and even, even stories of stock markets crashing and all the things kind of um, betrays our, 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 our stress and anxiety around that stuff because we are so tied to it. But Jesus is saying, this is so important as we dive in. He's saying that, that greed can blind you and you can't see it. That's the problem with greed. You know, other sins, you know you're committing certain sins, right? Like, don't commit adultery. Nobody ever says, oh, wait, ho, oh, you're not my spouse. Wow, how did that happen? You know, nobody does that. Um, nobody, like, you know when you murder someone. You know when you're lying most of the time. Not always. There is self-deceived there as well. We've talked about how anger can be that way too. The, the, the anger can be a thing that, that kind of we're blinded to at times. Jesus says, wherever your treasure is, and we all treasure, whatever you uh, value the most is going to guide your thoughts, your actions, your life. And, and it is good to remind ourselves here, Proverbs has been teaching us that the heart, he says, wherever the treasure is, that's where your heart will be. What does he mean? The heart in the Hebrew understanding is not uh, the, the seat of emotions as the mind is the seat of reason. The understanding of the heart is that it's the seat of your greatest loves. It's the seat of your greatest, most committed devotions. It's the thing you place your trust in. That is where your heart runs. And that's what he's saying here. And everything flows out of that is what scripture teaches us. So if it's mammon, this love for money, he says we're deceived. Mammon is materialism, you could say. It's uh, all things earthy, not spiritual. We know we talk a lot about secularism, uh, which literally means earthy, non-spiritual. So secularism and materialism go hand in hand. And yet in the global West, this is what's interesting. We rage against secularism, rightfully, under, understandably, but not materialism, not so much. And today we're going to bring this message that is countercultural, which is why sometimes it's hard to hear messages about money. And so today we're going to really look at some paradoxes that we see, which makes it difficult. Why are we deceived? Why do we not get our minds around this? And it's because of paradoxical truths that we see in the kingdom of God. And, and I want to start with an umbrella paradox that is true uh, for all of us. And it's the paradox of hedonism, it's called. I've talked about this before. This is not an explicitly Christian thing. It's a philosophical thing. Um, and it, it is a truth it, it, that, that, that there's this paradox of hedonism. And it's this, happiness will never be found by pursuing happiness. It's found by pursuing something else. In fact, Viktor Frankl, who was an Austrian psychologist who survived the Holocaust, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. A great book you ought to read. It's not, not a real big book. And, and, and he wrote, after he um, was, was released, lost all of his family in, in the Holocaust, in, in the concentration camps. But he writes this in his book, Man's Search for Meaning. Happiness can be, cannot be pursued. It must ensue, which means it must follow, right? It, it's the result of. And it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself or as the byproduct of one's surrender to a person other than oneself. Now, he was a Jew. This sounds explicitly Christian. Many of us have discovered the pursuit of Jesus Christ, someone other than ourselves, all out pursuit of him is where we find happiness. We call it joy, peace, success in life that frees us up to be generous. And so with that umbrella idea, this paradox that we wrestle with, I wanna look at three paradoxes today. 
The first one, and you can write all these down. You'll find them in our, our resource guide. Um, if you want to go there, uh, you can find them here in, this, uh, in the QR code here. Uh, it's our, our sermon response guide that's out every week. You can find it online, those of you who are watching. You can go there later uh, today and dive deeper in this week into this passage. The first paradox I want you to see is this. The more you have, the more you want. Now, some of you might say, well, no, I've kind of arrived. I'm there. I'm okay. But let's talk about this. There's this law of diminishing returns, and the paradox is such that wealth distorts our understanding of what matters the most. And so the more you have, really, I could argue, oftentimes the less we have, because we miss the things that matter the most. We're going to see this throughout the Proverbs. In fact, turn to uh, Proverbs 8. You can see Proverbs 8, because what we're going to see here is oftentimes we miss the thing that gives us hope and gives us life. And whatever becomes our functional God is where our hearts go. So we must discern between wealth and true wealth is what the Bible teaches us. In Proverbs 8, 18 and 19, it says this, riches are uh, richer, riches and honor are with me. And then he, he qualifies that. Enduring wealth and righteousness, okay? Verse 19, my fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, my yield than choice silver. Now, we've heard a lot about fruit and harvest and yield, even in our worship this morning. My dad used to say this, all that glitters is not gold. I remember I was making a decision, uh, even in ministry, and, and, and I remember him telling me that. What he's saying is, and this is what the proverb says, I had a wise father, just as we have here, teaching me. And it's this, gold is not gold. Paradox, meaning gold being the highest value. Gold and silver, he references here. Not gold. He says, what is gold? We, we see this over and over again, is righteous living. And righteous living is genero generosity in action in every area of our lives. He's talking about a wealth that is beyond wealth. Because often, you see, wealth and our material things can blind us and deceive us into thinking what's most important. And so we, we want more. And often, the more we get, the more we want. We've seen it over and over again. Proverbs 10. Turn a couple chapters. Proverbs 10, verses 2 through 4. says this. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit. He's saying here, once we get, oftentimes we see people doing whatever it takes to get more. Now we slip into unrighteous living. This is what materialism can do. But righteousness delivers from death. There's that word, righteousness. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. He, he's a, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He's saying there's even, even, even qualitative joy and purpose in hard work. Not simply what you make from hard work, here he's talking about the quality of our riches and the way that we achieve them and get those things. See, wealth gained illicitly is corrupting and it needs to be, it's best to get rid of it. It's why generosity is the cure. Like Zacchaeus, the Lord called him out and he had become wealthy because he took advantage of other people and then he brought reparations back to those he stole it from. And the Lord tells us, listen, it, it, more and more wealth that's, that is corrupted is going to corrupt your life and no longer you're living this righteous life. So the Proverbs teaches us that life, joy, peace, and the security, safety you're really looking for is found in righteous living. And righteous living is wise living, is what the Proverbs teach us. Money that's gained wickedly isn't going to keep us safe. It's going to do the opposite. It's going to twist our hearts and it's going to take us down. But, but often, we're, we're willing to do whatever it takes because wealth, material things, and you don't have to have a lot, can become a drug. And you want the next thing and the next thing. Let me ask you, how are you doing? How are you doing in that? Do you, do you find yourself wanting the next, latest, best thing? I know, I know a, lot of, a lot of folks are into all kinds of gadgets, right? Like, gotta get the next phone, next version. Though your phone is working fine. You gotta get the next car. Your car is running really well. You got to get the new car, the next thing. You, 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 you need, we, we tear down our uh, uh, parts of our homes and to build nicer, be better, updated homes. And are you, do you fall into that trap? 
or maybe fashion. Maybe it's that for you. You've got to have the latest fashion. You look at the latest thing that's out. You've got to, you've got to wear it and you've got to make sure you get it. There's a balance there, isn't there? Because on the one hand, we can slip into this pursuit of happiness and seek an identity that's found in that. And, and, and it can become what drives us. We get nervous and anxious about not getting it, all right? Don't know if I have the right clothes. I'm not even going to show up at that thing. Really? See, there's a problem there. We're, we're, we're going too hard there. The first paradox is the more you want, or the more you have, the more you want. And paradox two is this. The more you give, the more you gain. This is a, a truth that we find throughout scripture and we see it here. Giving is gaining. Now, most people would credit all the good things that are happening in life around the world with people who are kind and generous, right? And most religions teach this, but no religion, if we could call it that, no faith has done more than Christianity in this regard. You think about the education around the world started by missionaries. Why? We want people to read. Be, not only because reading is, is leading and flourishing, we wanted them to read the Bible, to know the truth of God. You think about people who are being served and, and regarding food supplies and, and all that, that happens, our hospitals, right? You just look around Dallas where we see um, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baylor, which is Texas for Baptist, right? Um, <laughs> And in fact, I was down in Waco this week at the uh, state convention uh, with some of our friends and lots of our friends from across the state and um, heard incredible stories, you know, of what your money, our money's doing as we give. If you're giving to this church, I'm just telling you, you are wise. This is wise living because your money is being transformed to serve people, as we noted already, here in Dallas and around the world. I discovered or heard this, that the Texas Baptists, and I follow these guys, the Texas Baptist men uh, the, who, who are in a disaster relief. A lot of times you'll see them on the news uh, leading the way. They end up in Florida, there's a hurricane. They end up in Houston or a tornado. Wherever there's need, they go. The Israeli government reached out to the Texas Baptist men because 10,000 Jews fled from Ukraine after the Russians invaded Ukraine. And for a full month, every single day, Texas Baptist men fed 10,000 Jewish refugees. Your money made that happen. And there's a million stories. In fact, there's a journal that's coming out that is talking directly about how your money is helping make a difference here. I'm telling you, if you give to our church, you are managing your money wisely. Because we do this together as we seek to, to or, you know, really offer to the world what God has ordained us to do and, and to give. Proverbs 22, 9 says this, the generous will themselves be blessed for they share their food with the poor. We have opportunity, you've heard it already, we have to literally feed the poor. I'll be doing it. You can join us with all that you, you can see online and all the opportunities to serve throughout the holiday season. But this week, come and join us as we, we serve others. It's the greatest part of my Thanksgiving day to come and to serve. And then yes, we can join family and gather around all the plentiful opportunities that many of us have. Generosity will break the power of money on your life it's that paradoxical relationship he's talking about here. The generous are blessed. Those who don't share are not. They become poor. Look at Proverbs eleven twenty eight. 28. It says, whoever trusts in, in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. We grow as we give. You see, we become more and more generous, more righteous before the Lord as we give away. All of this is paradoxical. And, and blows our mind. We want more when instead giving away is what brings life and helps others to flourish like a green leaf. Proverbs 16, eight says this, better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. It, it's, it's saying this is one of those better than Proverbs we see a lot. Righteousness and justice are better than wealth and prosperity. Living with righteousness and justice. Proverbs eleven twenty four. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Paradox. Another withholds 
what he should give and only suffers want. You see, we all can be generous with what we have. I say it this way. If you have a little, give a little. If you have some, give some. If you have a lot, give a lot. Because we're all in this together. And all of this has to do with a proper understanding, a proper relationship, you could say, a proper belief about money, what it can do, what it can't do. And, and giving is the most powerful anecdote to materialism. You know this is true. And yet we struggle to believe it and then act upon it. In fact, I could say it this way, flip it around. If you're unable to give, if you do not give, it proves that money, materialism, has a grip on your heart. It's proof. So how are you doing? Lots of applications here today, and I want us all to be generous. I wanna wanna land this message by being very practical. How do we give? How much should we give? Look at Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10. It says this, honor the Lord with your wealth. And some of you here, well, I'm not wealthy. There's always somebody more wealthy than you. It's always relative, right? But we all have what the Lord's given us. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, this speaks up against the backdrop of what was the biblical tithe in the Old Testament. A tenth was, 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 was what the people were to give of their income to the Levites, to the priest, to support the work of the temple and to be given to the poor. And so first fruits is exactly that. That's what it's talking about here. And God says the failure to do so is to rob him, is what it says in Malachi 3. You're robbing God if you're not doing that. Now you might think, well, wow, pastor, you're kind of coming on strong. It sounds legalistic. Okay, the, the New Testament doesn't say explicitly, it doesn't speak explicitly to the tithe, but Jesus in Matthew 23, 23, he comes at a group of people for not going beyond the tithe. And I, and I say this because I believe, not simply because I'm a pastor, I've been practicing this, Stacy and I, since we got married. 10% and beyond should be the, the training wheels the minimum of Christian generosity. How could we give less than what was required in the Old Testament? Now that we have Christ, who's given us all that we need, all that we have, we have found in him. And so we can give at least 10% away. And I know this is really convicting for some of us because we're like, yep, I'm not. Listen, if you, if, here's the challenge for you. Here's an application to grow in your percentage giving, to grow in your percent, regardless of where it is. But if you're not at 10%, make that a goal to be at 10%. And some of you give well beyond 10%. I know that you do. We have such a generous church here and praise be to God. And again, this is, I want you to be so freed up and to experience the joy of giving. So let's land here with paradox three. It's this, the more you lose, the more you live. This is a paradox of the kingdom. We see it throughout the scriptures. But how about this? How much is enough? Let's, 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 let's go this route. How much is enough to live on? How, how much is enough? Proverbs 30. Turn to Proverbs 30. This is a core passage for us here. Verses 7 through 9. Proverbs 30, 7 through 9. And it says this. Two things. This is a really intriguing passage. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Okay, think about this for a minute. What two things would you ask for before you die? That's, that's worth maybe writing down, thinking about. Here's what this wise proverb says. This is not Solomon, by the way, here. But verse 8, remove far from me falsehood and lying. So help me live in the truth about myself and about you. I'm easily deceived. Help me to live in the truth about who I really am and about the world. That's a great first prayer. Give me, look at this, neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. You see what he's saying here? Here's another paradox we find. Poverty and prosperity are are equally dangerous. 
There's nothing righteous about being wealthy. There's nothing righteous about being poor. And it all starts with the truth about who God is and who we are. Because if we become too wealthy, here's what happens all the time. We then believe that we've done this on our own. Have you ever noticed this? Someone who's really wealthy, they might be in a meeting about something they know nothing about, really. But everybody's like, what does this guy have to say? He's really wealthy. He's successful. And he's clueless about the real things of life. And instead, we, what we should do is turn to those who are generous and gracious and righteous. He's saying, Lord, don't make me too wealthy because what will happen is I'll forget you. I'll say, who is the Lord? Who needs him? But don't make me poor because watch this. Here's the other side of that. I will so desperately want more along this continuum that I'll do whatever it takes to get it. There's temptations on both sides of this. We've all heard the adage, right? I know that money can't buy happiness, but I'd like to be the one that could prove that that would be the case. No, you wouldn't. Way too many people, more people go down because of wealth and prosperity than those who are poor. Both wealth and prosperity can alienate us from God because it's all about our relationship with money, mammon and worship. But let's land with this. The one thing that you cannot buy is the one thing you need the most. The most expensive thing that you and I can have is, is grace that's found in Jesus, forgiveness that comes, and we need to be mindful and discerning about how it relates to the things that God has given to us. Everything we have is his. We've sung about it, we say it all the time. We are stewards, we're not owners. Nothing you have, you have done on your own. God has given us all that we have. You may have worked really hard, but it's God who made that possible. See, it's Paul who said he knew how to live in prosperity and in poverty. Some of you could say the same. And and, and he was able to say that he's content regardless of where he finds himself on that continuum. Lord, don't make me too wealthy. Don't make me too poor. I'm content anywhere along that line because I have found my identity not in my stuff, but in Christ who has forgiven me. I live for him. And when I don't have much, I trust him all along the way. Because here's what can happen. Proverbs 10, 15 says, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city, but poverty is the ruin of the poor. He's saying we can find an identity and security in our wealth that is not sustained. Over time, it all breaks down. And so we gain by losing and we live when we lose ourselves. Jesus said it this way. He called a crowd to him with his disciples and he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Here it is. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. For what does it profit? Listen to this financial language. A man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul. For what can a man give in return for his soul? Friends, listen. If you're here today and you have not received the Lord, and all of us need to hear this, someday we're gonna stand before God Almighty. And it won't matter how much money you have. Not at all. You won't be able to to say, hey, my my scales over here, the scales are are weighed over here, here's here's, here's all that I have. It's not gonna matter at all. What will matter is what we did with all that we were given. To whom much is given, much is required. And let the words of our Lord speak into your heart. In Proverbs 11, 4, it says this, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. We've heard a lot about righteousness. Let me close this this series and this message with this. The only way that we can stand before a holy God righteous is by receiving Christ who becomes our exchange. Our ledger of bankruptcy, sin, and and, and, and opposition of God is replaced with the perfect obedient life of Jesus. And his ledger is flipped for ours. The great exchange says, we are made righteous because of him, not because of anything we've done. 
So if you've not received our Savior, I plead with you to do it today. Let's pray together. Lord, I ask that you would speak to every heart. And friend, if you're here today and you've never received Christ, other ones among us are praying for you right now. It's true, the more, more we have, the more we want, the more we give, the more we gain. The more we lose, the more we have life. Friend, give him your life. Receive his grace now. He died on the cross so that you could be totally forgiven, not punished for your sin. He took it upon himself so that you would be set free. And to receive by faith, not by works, praise him. Say yes to him. Lord, I ask you to come into my life. Make me rich in all the ways that will matter in this life and throughout all of eternity. I give you my life. And Lord, for us all, may we take this message and not leave it here in this room, but instead apply it to our lives. May we all become more generous. May we all give in ways that would honor you. Give of our time, our energies, our gifts, and our money. All to your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.